Let us pray. Most loving, most gracious, most forgiving Lord, we thank you for this glorious day and all days. We thank you especially for gathering us today to do the work that you have given us to do and to do the work that the people of Southport have given us to do. Guide us to make good and right decisions for the benefit of your creation and for all who live, work, and visit here. Amen. Madam Clerk, do you have anything for public comment? Adam Stedman. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Adam Stedman. Um, I live at Dutchman Creek Road. Uh, in the past, I've um, you know spoken about fiscal responsibility and the budget, etc. I have a budget request today that I think would be of substantial public benefit for the town. Um, there's a sable palmetto tree as you're approaching town between the uh, discharge canal, the Duke Energy, and Walmart that is about 25 feet high. And this tree must be removed as a result of this 211 widening. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the drainage ditch that's being put in there. It's right where the, you know, welcome to Southport sign was, uh, you know, before they removed it a few months ago. And this tree has been, it's been, um, a particular company has been subcontracted to remove this tree uh, by Barnhill. Um, this company has also removed some other trees coming into town, you know, in the traffic island, et cetera. Um, and it's a reputable company, done work for me. I, you know, I don't, do not have any financial interest in this company at all. I want to make that clear. But I do know that it's a reputable company. And um, there's a proposal, a very informal proposal. He could move the tree for the public benefit of Southport. Now, I would just be a facilitator. This would be something that would be contracted between this particular company and Southport. But basically, the informal quote is between fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars. So this tree could basically be removed and transplanted to you know a prominent city location for about fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars informal quote, right? So you know the town is spending upwards of seventy thousand dollars to preserve the oak trees in Franklin Square Park, and I'm in support of that idea as well. But this would be an opportunity to you know, basically transplant a 20, 25 foot tree to a prominent public location. I, you know, I've talked with Tom Stanley. Tom Stanley talked with the Forestry Committee, Scott Lynn in particular, and they actually proposed a location for this tree, I think near the pump station, if I'm not mistaken, near the waterfront. So there's already been some work behind the scenes, so to speak, um, you know, as to, you know, moving this tree. It's really just a matter of getting the public uh, approval, you know, the city approval and the public funding for the idea. So keep in mind this fifteen to $1,800 would be just over 2% of what's being spent on Franklin Square. This would be a way to, you know, move a native species, a sable palmetto, a prominent tree as you're coming into town toward the waterfront. So, you know, we'd basically move it from along the road to right along the waterfront for everyone's public enjoyment. So I think it would be a really beneficial idea um, and if the city were to approve it would not want to allocate the funds I'd be happy you know within all ethical guidelines to try to make up the shortfall myself if necessary because I think it's really important to save this tree so um, the time is of the essence on it just be mainly because of the timing of the road construction and everything so you know the tree is going to have to be removed within the next couple months I mean you know I've I know the city manager mentioned, oh, well, maybe next year, but that's, you know, unfortunately next year is not going to be, an, you know, it's not going to be possible because, you know, the road construction is going to necessitate removal of this tree within, you know, the next few months. I mean, it's just necessary based on road construction, et cetera. 
So I would really appreciate it if the town would consider allocating money to this tree. I think the cost benefit of this would be really um, beneficial. I don't think you can really get much more, you know, uh, benefit for the, for the amount of money spent. And keep in mind, this would not be a recurring expense. This would be a one-time expense to, you know, save a prominent tree coming into town and transplant it to a place that I would actually think would be even better in terms of location for everyone's public enjoyment. So thank you very much for your consideration. All right. Bye. No, there are no com public comments. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next thing is the approval of the agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye, please. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the next in, uh, item is item F1. Um, I'm sorry. The introduction of new employees. Are you doing that? Right? No. It just see after the person's name. Dory's first and then. It's either Tom or Dory, can you get up? Good morning, everyone. Um, today, I would just like to introduce our new permit tech, Penny Tysinger. Tysinger, excuse me. Um, she's got over 30 years of local government experience, and she's actually been planning supervisors and directors before. So we're very pleased to have her with us. Um, if you want to come up and just wait. Good morning. It's nice to meet everyone. I've had a great turnout since I've been here a couple several weeks now, and it's just been a pleasure working with Southport. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ellie, would you introduce the new Ellie? <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ellie Pittenger. I'm on my last few legs of uh, getting towards retirement here, and I have a very capable gentleman uh, who will be replacing me. And I would like to introduce you all to the city's new energy manager, Mr. Larry Ditton. Just say hello. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with you all. Thank you, sir. And I've enjoyed the conversation we've had already, so I look forward to further education. So the next, uh, Mr. Jarvis, are you up? For, this is for presentations of the Capital Improvement Plan. Um, and I, I really do want to thank the, uh, Mr. Jarvis and the uh, department heads for putting this together because we've, we've asked you to find some rocks and we haven't described what the rocks are. Okay, thank you and good morning. Um, what I'd like to do is briefly describe what goes into a capital improvement program, how we arrived at where we are today and, and what we're requesting uh, you all to do uh, as we go forward with our uh, 2025 budget year. So, for those of you who were not here last year, uh, a capital improvement program, or a CIP as we'll call it, is a multi-year plan that's used to define the scope, schedule, and financing of major capital improvement projects for the city government. The city of Southport is now in its second year of preparing and updating this program. The intent of the six-year capital improvement program is to make a plan that shows steady progress in preserving the capital assets of the city. Typically, a capital asset is defined as a city-owned physical asset that has a useful life of more than five years and is of significant value. Capital projects are undertaken to install or improve the useful life of those capital assets. They typically occur as one-time projects, but they may be phased in over a period of fiscal years depending upon the financing and other factors. Capital projects are usually differentiated from ordinary repairs or recurring maintenance. Some examples of capital projects include land acquisitions, the construction of or major improvements to public buildings, recreation facilities, 
roads, and utilities. It's also, it also includes the acquisition of large equipment such as fire trucks. The city's infrastructure continues to age and as stewards of the city's resources, it's incumbent upon us to monitor the condition of our infrastructure assets, their lifespans and replacement costs, and to repair or replace those assets accordingly. Building a capital improvement program is a multi-month process that requires input and coordination with various city departments to define their project scope, cost, schedule, and financing methods. All impacted city departments collaborated with us to include their projects that generally cost more than $100,000. When the CIP is finalized, projects within the first year of the plan are used as a basis for the capital projects portion of the annual operating budget. Unless they're phased projects that occur over multiple fiscal years, the projects are then removed from subsequent CIP documents. Every attempt will be made to retain the capital projects that are scheduled for a given fiscal year. However, the document is indeed dynamic and scheduling may change based on financing, priorities, or several other factors. As a result, projects may be moved up, moved back, or even eliminated from the plan. The annual review and revision of the CIP ensures that the intent of the program is being met. The Capital Improvement Program provides community leaders and city officials with a clear view of what lies ahead. Having an adopted Capital Improvement Program also assists the city, also assists the city with establishing a bond rating and receiving grant funding. Our intent today is to provide this background on the Capital Improvement Program's preparation and to entertain the board's feedback on how it wishes to proceed with subsequent reviews of the CIP, recommendations, and finalization of that CIP. And with that, I will entertain questions. Are there questions from the board? I'm, I'm sorry. I... Alderman Mosteller, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Did you have questions? No, it's a lot to take in. Okay. <laughs> I've studied, I've got things, but I think there's too specific at this point to discuss. Yeah, I have a, a whole bunch of notes, but one of the things, that, uh, and I was talking to the manager about that, is that when we're looking at this document, it has figures in it, cost figures. Right. And some of those costs are where well, the money's already been encumbered. Let's assume we're going to put a new electrical station in. Mm -hmm. So I can see a dollar amount in the millions of dollars, but that's not millions of dollars I have to find tomorrow. We already have that millions of dollars in a fund. Correct. And then I'm <clears throat> as many times as Chief Drew has tried to bang this into my head, I've never got it all in my head. Um, and I say that positively, okay? Um, there's f fees, there's a cost for fire trucks. And I believe that comes out of the fire district fee right. as opposed to our budget. Correct. We might approve it, but it comes out. So that's not additional money that we would have to find. Right. So when I first looked at this document, I went, holy camoly, <laughs> this, you know, it's, it's, it's coming close to the national budget here. Um, so maybe in another version of this, we could have what the real cost is, what you figure we should spend out, and then do we have that money in some grant fund thing so we know that that's not money we have to find? Because as we've been talking, you have discretionary funds and non-discretionary funds in the budget. The f one of the things you have to figure out is what are the <coughs> things you have to do just to keep the wheels <coughs> going, and then whatever's left over out of the basically two funding streams that we have, right. um, how much money is left over? And that we'll, we'll continue to work on. But um. right. We've tried to, uh, in, the, in the summary portion, uh, divide uh, the <coughs> funding required into general fund, what's what's, uh, what may result from state and federal funding, uh, what funding may be allocated to date, other sources, which are, as, as you mentioned, the fire fund and, and things like that. But we're happy to uh, break that down even further if, if, uh, if the board requires that. 
I think it, for either both us looking at it and for the citizens looking at it, mm -hmm. it might help to sure. realize that <clears throat> we're not starting from a vacuum. Right. That we have this board and the previous board that have been putting money away doing things and that this is when we start to spend that money. Sure. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts at this point? I'm going to ask the manager just to talk about how this interacts with the budget coming up. Well, it's our thought that when you start reviewing the budgets on the 23rd with the departments, we can then talk about their specific capital needs. Uh, meanwhile, when you receive the um, proposed budget on the 15th is what we're gearing for to give the whole budget to you. You will also find my recommendation, um, Dory and Lance and I are working on the budget as we speak um, as to where we think we can find the funding to do this. So we're in the midst of trying to put all that together. In fact, we have a meeting this afternoon on it. Uh, thank you. And once again, you know, there's a, a lot of topics in here. Some of them overlap. If we do A, then B doesn't have to be done. So we've asked you, my terminology, we've asked you to go find a bunch of rocks. We haven't told you what those rocks look like uh, because this board has to make some hard decisions about which things, one, we can do, and then of those that we want, I can think of one project in particular that could consolidate three different things into it. And that would be theoretically a cost saving. However, there's a downside to every decision that you make. So we have to kind of figure that out. But for you and the uh, department heads, thank you. We've been hearing for, gosh, years from people saying, why don't you have a, a master plan for all the things that you've got to do? Ta-da, here it is. The uh, next one is uh, Cheyenne for the audiovisual op options. Board, Mayor, good morning. Happy April 1st. I cannot believe we're already in April. Um, but what this presentation is uh, to kind of go over some of the AV options, solutions, and potential concerns with both AV systems um, in the community building where we are now and also in Indian Trail Meeting Hall. Also, please feel free to stop me at any point if you need to. Alrighty, so some of our current AV concerns that have been brought to my attention um, that both I've experienced, the board has experienced, the public has experienced. Uh, in the community building specifically, it is difficult to view content on the vibe board. Uh, this is a 65 inch board, um, so right around that five and a half uh, feet diagonal. Um, so it's difficult for folks who are sitting in the corner of the room, like where Chief Corn is, or even where Alderman Lay and Alderman Spencer are sitting, um, to see what is on the board. Um, and uh, incorporating remote two-way participation um, so that if a board member or we have a presenter who is remote or needs to be remote or away, finding a way to get them in this room with this board or a board of similar nature. Um, right now, this board does not have a webcam. We have a, um, a separate one, a third, not third party, but a separate webcam that we can plug into it. Um, but part of that issue is with our streaming um, system. So I'll get into that in just a few moments as well. Uh, current concerns in Indian Trail Meeting Hall, the microphone system is obsolete. We, we know that we have those issues um, often. Uh, the camera system is outdated. It is becoming close to being obsolete. It still does work, um, but it is that old school camcorder setup that I had whenever 25, 26 years ago when I was a little tot running around. That's where all my home videos are. Um, and when we have presenters, y'all are not able to actually see 
the presentation because the, the TV is behind you. So those are our current concerns that I'm going to address throughout the presentation. Again, if you have another one, please, please feel free to let me know. My computer's not gonna change the vibe board. Some of the solution concerns that I have, because we do have solutions, so I wanna go in ahead and be upfront about those as we're getting into it. Um, both buildings are multi-purpose, so it is difficult to put something that is a permanent or semi-permanent solution here um, if it cannot easily be removed or put up or removed by one person. Um, I do all of the setup and breakdown. 99% of the time it's just me and in my hands getting it done so that way we're still getting the process done for meetings and such. In the community, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, in the community building, this AV system, so the mic system, the new camera, um, this system is less than two years old, so it doesn't need to be replaced right now. It still works well. It's just finding something that will work with the, with the system, uh, which that's not the difficult part, finding the things. Um, here's a more difficult solution concern. Getting a bigger vibe board, we have to be very cautious of the height of our door frames. So we have to be careful with how big of a board we get um, and looking at stands to see if there's like a hydraulic stand of some sort where we can raise it when necessary or lower it. But these door frames we don't have a problem with because I believe they're 10 foot frames. The hallway door frames where we store um, the vibe board in the AV room, those are your standard I don't know, seven foot door frame. So it's more difficult to get a bigger board because as those extend diagonal, they also extend upward, not just width. In Indian Trail, what are some of our solution concerns? We'll need to pick a camera system that will still be able to integrate well into our current streaming system, which is called BoxCast. And the reason for that is we use that streaming system in both buildings. And so those streaming settings are intertwined with each other. So making sure that whatever system we have works with BoxCast. Uh, BoxCast is a well-known streaming service though, so again, it's not going to be difficult to find something to work with it. Um, where we're going to probably run into some concern, more concerns with that is going to be pricing. Uh, presentations on the Vibe Board would potentially, this has further explanation in another slide, but um, Presentations on the vibe board, if we were to get a new one in here, move this one to Indian Trail, would need to be manually done or we'd have two clickers. That's not an issue because if we were to put the vibe board in Indian Trail, it would go, you guys know where I sit, like in the back, uh, right behind me. So I can either reach up and tap the screen or I can forward press it. There are easier solutions to needing two clickers. So the options. Uh, Biggest option in here is figuring out something to do with the screens. The first solution that I came up with was get a bigger screen, uh, but then we run into the, the height. So we would need to look into getting a, a like hydraulic stand of some sort or a shorter stand that's still at the same, like the bottom level is still at the same height. So that way we're not losing uh, too much of the viewing uh, space, square footage, square inches. Another um, option or solution that has been brought to our attention is putting mounting screens somehow in here. Um, and it, it's not that we haven't thought about it or things of that nature, but because this is a multi-purpose building, it would need some sort of covering for it. And I, I don't have control over the building. It's not my building. I share, I share this building with community relations. So I do have Elena in the back. If you have any building specific questions for community building or Indian Trail, because those are both run by the community relations department. Um, so that way she'll be able to answer those specific questions that I'm not able to. Uh, for Indian Trail solution options, this is the first bullet was where I was talking about if we get a new board in here or a new solution here, we can actually take the vibe board to Indian Trail mounted on that back wall so that way we've got the TV for our uh, public viewers to see and then the vibe board for y'all to see from where you sit in Indian Trail so that way everybody can see what's going on. An upgraded microphone system. Um, as of right now I do have a demo scheduled for y'all on our first budget review day or budget workshop day um, with it would be a Shure S-H-U-R-E audio product. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that once we get to the cost section because 
it is a little it was a little pricey but i would like to tell you more about those microphones when we get there and then an upgraded camera and live streaming system if necessary all right anticipated cost for the community building for a new smart board or interactive whiteboard we're looking at around seven to ten thousand um, dollars there are a couple options that i've looked at uh, the vibe brand which is this one a smart board which is what you've probably seen in classrooms for when when y'all were um, coming through or your children or your grandchildren um, or a bin q board so <laughs> if you've been in the eoc in the fire department the fire department has a bin q board um, that has all of the interactive features that we're looking for and it's a beautiful board and it works wonderfully i like playing with it um, but they also have a 75 and 85 inch option as well but again we get into those kind of weird size constraints but for that we're looking at upwards of somewhere between seven and ten thousand dollars for Indian Trail Meeting Hall, this is where we will probably see or we're anticipated to see a lot more of the cost going towards um, taking the vibe board from one building to the other. That is just the cost of staff manpower. Um, so that is just our part of our day to day work. Um, an upgraded microphone system. This is the demo that I have scheduled for y'all on April 23rd. Uh, I did not put this in the presentation y'all got because I just got it on Thursday. Um, the microphone system itself would be around $48,000. Um, so what that system would be, it's, this is the upward number because I requested it for 20 microphones um, so that we had extras. But again, I wanted to aim high and then bring it down instead of saying, hey, here's the price for 10, but we need 15. Um, so it would be 20 microphone sets. So it would be the base of the microphone, well, like the, the base and then the gooseneck um, and then the system that goes with it. These would be rechargeable, uh, so no batteries. Whew. Um, and after every meeting, I would be able to go put them where they are in their case, plug them in, and they'd be fully charged, ready to go. Um, they do have a eight to 12 hour capacity um, for time. So, you know, we can, uh, we can really get into these evening meetings, you know, um, but uh, part of why the, the price is so expensive is because of the base. The base does allow for voting capacity. Um, so that could be sent directly to the clerk's, the clerk's computer system or microphone. So that way she can, it'll show, it's like, hey, Alderman Carroll voted this way and Alderman Kelly voted this way. And then it comes up and we have that full record right there. So we don't have to scramble and say, oh, where, where, where did the votes go? Um, not where did the votes go, but like who voted where, if it's not unanimous. So that's a little bit about that microphone system. And then that's, that's option A. So just the microphone, but we keep the current uh, camera and filming system. Yes. Why would we not move this dated equipment to that location and this new equipment to this location? That's a great question. So this equipment is all hardwired in this building. Um, so I can, I can look into that and see what it would take to uh, swap it out and see what that would look like if the current wiring and system could support a new system um, and then what it would take labor and material wise to get the system over there. So I can definitely look into that and see what that looks like. Um, so the option A was the one microphone and then option B would be upgrading the, the entirety of it. So essentially getting the system that we have in here right now and getting a second one to go in Indian Trail Meeting Hall. That one is around $40,000. Um, and that is from Landmark Integrations. Those are the consultants who uh, did this system two years ago, excuse me. Uh, and they are out of Hampstead, North Carolina. Um, I do have another meeting on uh, April 16th with uh, Acoustic Creations, they're out of Wilmington. I was not able to get a hold of them before we had, or get with them before the meeting today. So that's kind of, or not kind of, that, that is where we're at with our audio visual. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am so glad you mentioned that because when I was going over all of this on the agenda, I thought to myself, you know, first of all, you have done an enormous amount of really good work on this. And I think you understand some of the, the built-in problems that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. that we have a system here, for example, that meets needs that are counter our needs. I mean, having things placed there 
the reason for that, it's boxed in and it has nothing to do with the public's or our need to be able to see. And I mean, for example, I can't see the whole screen because the podium uh, partly blocks it. Um, people down at that end probably have difficulty even seeing the screen. People get up to address us as you are right now and you are having difficulty actually looking at us Normally, people who do public uh, comment are making the comment to the rest of the audience instead of to us. And then, of course, our placement here. Um, in my time on the board, we have sat with our backs to the river. We have sat with our backs to um, Garrison. We have sat here. I think the only place we haven't sat is that way. and. None of it really works well, but it really doesn't work with the audiovisual needs. And I'm just talking about this building. So I went to Google, of course, and um, I found half a dozen places in Wilmington that do this. This is their business. The, they are experts at this. And the one you just mentioned, you know, for example, for state and local government, our team of professional audiovisual integrators will work in conjunction with your blah, blah, blah. They know what they're doing. All we have to do, I think, and they do free consultations, or so they say, and um, we have to figure out what we want. What are our needs? Mm -hmm. And we have that situation where our needs as a board and our needs to be able to present things well to the public, run counter to the needs of those who rent this building and produce revenue for the city. I don't envy your, your job <laughs> at all, Cheyenne, but it's on us, the board, to sort out those requirements and then figure out how we meet them. And so my recommendation out of all this is that we keep getting information, um, that we reach out to experts to help you and help us come up with the kind of solutions that will meet all of our requirements, not just what we want, but what, we, what really is the requirement for us to be able to serve, our, serve the public and do the work that we do. And um, figure out what's the best price we can get. Yes, ma'am. That that is the the price and the cost. That's that's really where we're running into a lot of our our hiccups. But. I mean, for forty thousand dollars, I'm willing to start just yelling. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh! I, I have the line on an HDMI splitter if we need that. Uh, <laughs> So I, I do have a question. So we have this wonderful drop down here that I've seen used at events. I've seen used um, for city events. Why can we not use that? What, what are we missing that we're, we're not able to use that and the, the board at the same time? So the biggest uh, hiccup with if we were to use the projection screen again is who would run it? Uh, so when it, like sitting in the back, I monitor the different, like the, it's almost like a TV studio when we have our live stream meetings. So we stream to the website, social media, um, and also to, to the television. Uh, so that would be the biggest hiccup is figuring out like who would run it or how to integrate the two since that's not a smart projector, so to speak. I'm not sure, and I can look into that. I'm not sure how we could connect both the the switcher, the vibe board presentation, and the projector, wherever it could go. Um, and then one other issue that we would have with a projector is we don't really have anywhere to put a projector. So if we had it drop down, it's the ceiling's too high, and if it was behind or underneath the camera, then we have potential issue, um, potential crossing that would happen with the two two streams. But I, I can look into that. Uh, certainly, my, my kids have figured out how to make things go on multiple screens on multiple times, and certainly um, I'm not giving them any money to do it, and they find a cord and they make it work. So um, I also know that there is a girl who grew up in Southport who has an audiovisual company who would be glad to come in and consult for us for free. Um, I don't know what the rules are for that with 
the, you know, if that's a, an issue for the city, but I'd be happy to reach out to her and have her come talk that to us. That would be great. Cheyenne. It seems to me we could also look at, I guess architectural is the right word, or construction. If we had a screen permanent, we never use this fireplace, right? I mean, I, I can't I think remember it has it ever been used being for used. events before, but we as the city in the two years I've been here have not used it, no ma'am. If we had a permanent screen coming down at least partway and had cabinetry in front of it that would slide away or, you know, and just open up, then that would always be there. I hate the fact that you are physically hauling this stuff around. And I'd like to work out a solution where you don't have to do that. Alderman Spencer. <clears throat> what I'm going to say is not against you. Thank you for the work. But I think we're becoming very content and satisfied with having meetings in this building. This was a temporary solution and now we're spending tens of thousands of dollars when we really need to be across the street in City Hall in the chambers. This is not the place to have city meetings. This was a temporary solution. And I hate spending short-term, uh, long-term money on short-term problems. It's like we've got all these desires and wishes and we can't even put our pants on. It's like, when are we going to slow down and get control of it? <clears throat> that's one of the things that Cheyenne and I have talked about because I know I've had a lot of um, um, some of you have said it to me well how come we can't be Oak Island well, how come we can't be Brunswick County why can't we do our AV stuff and the answer is because you don't have a permanent council chambers they do and that's the difference so we have a place here we, it's used five, six different ways, and so we always have to keep that in mind when we're trying to solve this problem. Diane, and, getting back real, real short term, if whatever system we get, a lot of times you're taking a look at the agenda and it says it's on page 22 to 25. Do we have the ability to just shoot that up onto the screen? That way I'm not going like this to try to find it? Like put the agenda itself on the screen yeah. or all of the items yeah, on the just, agenda? Just a particular page because you know, unless you got a hard copy here, uh, if, you're, if I'm sitting here looking at it in my screen, I'm having to scroll through at 100 miles an hour trying to find what we're talking about. So it would be easier if there's a way, and I don't know if there is, to put that on the screen. I'm sure that there is, and I can talk to the clerk some more about this as well, but the one of the issues with larger files especially since our agendas are so large sometimes is the this is the vibe board is a computer so sometimes the file is too large for the vibe board to read it uh, in enough time so there's a lag I'm sure like some of you have seen before like if somebody's hitting the clicker and then it stops and then all of a sudden we're three slides ahead so it, it's there is a little bit of delay but I can talk with the clerk on that and see if there's a way that we can um, come to a happy medium if we know that there's something that is going to be asked or probably going to be asked if we can put it into the slideshow so that it's available on the day of the meetings. Is there a way that we can follow up on that, that whatever boards we're looking at in the future, that's a question that's, that is asked? Yes, sir. I've had the same, same question that Frank has had, is that if we're talking about page 243, and we, me, I have a hard copy so I can look at page 243, everybody else is fumbling through computers trying to find it, the audience has no idea what's going on. If we can figure out, if we're gonna spend money in the future, how you hit 243 and it immediately pops up. What, what's, what capacity do you have to have to do that? Yes, sir. I have some really basic questions, so y'all bear with me, and I appreciate all the work that you've done on this. Um, but going back to the idea that this is a temporary solution, um, we can go to Walmart and buy a 75 inch TV and hang it right there. We can plug in an HDMI cord to a presentation. We can continue with the vibe board and we can do a zoom where it's inconvenient for us to look at, but we can do a zoom and pop the, um, the agenda on that. Anybody who wants to zoom in for the agenda can have it right in front of them. 
I'm talking $1,000, $1,500 to do that versus $40,000 to do a whole system. Um, once we have a permanent chambers, that makes a whole lot of sense to spend that kind of money. But until that point, I have a really hard time uh, thinking that that's where we need to be. Um, and a big TV screen here um, for weddings and events and all that, as everybody has their slideshows that they want to share during their event, that allows them to do that as well. Um, it's not just a single use option for us. It takes away the need for a projector screen and it would allow us to offer that potentially as another amenity for those people who are considering renting the space um, for those events as well. So just something to think through. And then there's a way that when we're not using it, if people say, oh, well, I don't want that ugly screen there, we can put up a picture of downtown Southport or the waterfront or whatever on it so it doesn't just look like an empty screen that's there in, in the way. The short answer is there is not a way for us to connect what would be posted or put on that TV or there is a way, a 50, 75 foot HDMI cord, but then it's another cord for us to run and or another item that I or whoever is, is manning the screen would have to maintain. I, I can do that through Wi-Fi on my TV at home now. So I can, um, I, I can just do it from my phone and put it up on the TV. Um, so I can screencast that. So we don't need to hardwire it either. I can look into it. Thank you. Uh, my, my only question is really directed at the board and with the challenges that we face this budget cycle, is this even a priority? Well, I don't know. I don't know what we could get to that until we get to the budget really. That was my no. preface about what are, what are the things that we need to pay for this salaries and all of that to keep the train going, how much money's left over, Manager has some ideas about some other funding capabilities. So when we get to there, that is where this will all come down. And then we have to answer the big elephant in the room. Are we going to get a permanent rooms for us to do the business, the city's business in? And we haven't resolved that issue yet. So that's going to be, I assume, come up in the budget cycle as well. I do have a question for you. <clears throat> When we got to the talking about how we can do, uh, we, the seven of us, can um, virtually participate, our IT people said, yeah, you can do that. You just have to buy another software package that's already going to integrate, that's already part of the package that you have. Are they involved in these conversations? Yes, sir, they are. And the what we're running into right now with the, uh, the remote participation is there is currently a delay. Um, so there is a delay from the stream to where it is streaming to. So the social media, the website, um, and then the BoxCast app if somebody has a smart TV. Uh, that is a that is something through BoxCast that we are in conversations with to get that removed um, or what that would look like if we can. So that way it is as live or as live time, real time as possible. Um, so even, but with that being said, even if we do get rid of that, we do have completely real time. There will probably still be a few second delay on somebody who is doing a remote participation just because of how internet speeds work and things like that. Right now, the delay is approximately 90 seconds. I, I, every month, every month, I participate in, a, in meetings with lots of money being involved in the whole thing and it's live and I can vote like that. There's got to be a way that we can do this. There has to be a way. I do it sitting in my office at home with a, with a computer that's 15 years old. It so, goes so, back to the live stream. So there are things that we could do if it was just in this room in a remote mm -hmm. participator, but it, wanting to make sure that the person who is participating remotely, if they're wanting to make, or making sure that they can still be heard and observed by those who are viewing them, that's where the issue comes in. And then those systems are also expensive. Um, so that, because that's a completely separate system, those, those types of voting systems. Meryl, could you find out from the 
organization that you're referring to that, you know, I know what it is, but it's can you find Teams. out from them what technology and it's software and everything it I, is? We, we, I can do that. And, 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 and we've had this conversation just prior to this meeting. So what staff has done here is, is terrific work. And what we're trying to do is flush out options for what was originally a temporary facility which has turned into a longer than temporary facility, and what is our next option to go to something else if we're going to go to something else. So there's a lot of unknowns here that we're asking you to fix without telling you how, what the finished thing is supposed to look like. So again, I, I, I compliment you and everybody that's working with you, but I, I do wanna keep coming back to this topic as you flush it out to help us understand how that might integrate into our bigger decisions of what we're going to do in the future. Yes, sir. Cheyenne. Uh, I, we've got Indian Trail down there, and to, to have a meeting there is, uh, you have to go to a chiropractor after it's over because you're, twi you're twisting around. Is there a short-term solution to what we could do there to upgrade that facility so it'd be easier to have a meeting there? Because it, it can be tough on both the board and the people sitting in the audience. I mean, you're, you're always twisting and turning, and it's almost impossible to really focus in on what's happening. I think another TV would solve that issue. Um, I have a question, and this might be for you, Bonnie. Um, what are the requirements for streaming? Can we do a Zoom and people have to log in to see what we're doing, and then the Zoom is recorded, and then we can post a recorded meeting afterwards? That is not a question for the manager who is so bad at IT. Okay. So, Elena, um, Cheyenne, um, that's not my thing. There, so the, the biggest requirement for whenever you start filming meeting, government meetings is once you start, you can't stop. Uh, so, so that's the biggest one, and check, we're there. Um, for the Zoom, so Brunswick County as a whole, like for their commissioner meetings, that is currently how they do their meetings and they're looking at getting another system like this. Um, I can look some more into it. Uh, part of the reason, to, to be honest, that we haven't looked more into that is because of the current system that we have and how we can stream it to three different areas. So with a Zoom meeting, you're semi-limited to where you can view or how you can view. Um, but I can look more into that as well. Because I, mean, I was on a Zoom last week where we were in a room together. We were, as a group, on the Zoom with 250 other groups on the Zoom. And we could all communicate in real time. We could see comments in addition to um, have, you know, whoever's talking pops up on the screen and is the primary person on the screen. And then once that meeting was over, we posted it to the Facebook page for that group, and it was there as well as to the website for the um, group. And anyone who wasn't able to be there and log in for it was able to then watch the whole thing if they so chose afterwards um, and see the comments and all of that. Um, so, I mean, when we're talking about number of people, maybe, oh, we can't do it because people can't log in. We had 250 on there. I don't know that we've ever had a meeting with 250 people trying to log in for us anywhere here in Southport. Um, so it's an economical solution that I appreciate you looking into for that. Yes, ma'am. When, when you, I can't, I can't get a Pringles can out of my head because you just said once you start, you can't stop. Does that mean? Oh, uh, for, for the, okay. For an so, individual meeting or once we started this process, we can never go back to not. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me, I'm sorry. Let me clarify. So as an, as a board, um, so board of aldermen and planning board, those are the two that we regularly film every, every month. Um, since we have started live streaming and filming those, you as a board would have to make the decision to no longer film um, so it, it lies within y'all's hands but it's it, the the process of it you would have to go about as it's it's not an ordinance but like you would have to go through the process to to make that the new norm that we wouldn't be live streaming every meeting or it would just be special like historic preservation for example we do not live stream all of their meetings we only live stream their special or joint meetings I just have a hard time because I go, oh, the contractor goes, ooh, government contract, I can jack the price for this. Um, so I have a real hard time with looking at this pricing, knowing that I'm doing this 
in other groups that I'm in for a teeny tiny fraction of what they're talking to us about right now. And I think I might need to become an AV expert and I'd be happy to consult for the city for 40 grand to get it done. Yes, audio visual is extremely expensive. You have young AV experts at home, don't you? I do, they'll, they'll come next time. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I do wanna tell you that for Alderman Davis, the AV part was chalk. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, I she know. said whiteboard. I was pretty certain it was black. <laughs> or, or green. And I was with her. <laughs> hey, I had chalk too. <laughs> um, one Listen, last thing. It was an honor to be able to clean the erasers. Yes. Oh, that was punishment when I was coming through elementary school. That, that's how you got, you got out, you couldn't do recess because you got to go out and clap the chalk um, before we got the whiteboards. Uh, but one thing before I do step away, I did uh, think of one more thing that uh, both the, the microphone package that we looked at and then also the full AV package for Indian Trail, those did include the ADA compliant um, specifications that we are required to have. So like we have the, the in-ears right outside or at the check-in table. Um, those two systems did include what it would take to uh, fit Indian Trail to make sure that we are continuing to be ADA compliant. I guess my last question is if we get a new board and this one goes over the Indian head or what do we do? We actually could get two boards well, and they could be wheeled in. And I, I'd like to have them mounted on the ceiling and we put a cover over them. But if that can't happen for whatever reason, because we're um, then electronically, I don't think we have to have cable f trip and fall issues here with cables. We should be able to, to do that. If that means we have to boost the Wi-Fi in this building, then, then that's what we have to do. But we should be able to have two screens, one on each side, so at least the people on this side can see mm -hmm. what's going on. Absolutely. Um, can I ask a follow-up question to your question? Would, Absolutely. If we add a second board, would this size or something close to this size be as okay as possible simply for the, the clearance? Or, and I'm going to look well, into I, both. I, but I'd also like to look at, have you look at stands that can go up and down. Absolutely. I mean, I don't, you know, you talk about hydraulics. I don't know if it has to be that sophisticated, but that's your, that, that's too much in the weeds for me to be doing. The bigger the board that you can get to get through the door over there is the board that I want. Yes, sir. Okay, and two of those, if we're gonna do this, that would be my, my wish. Obviously, this is a board decision, and the cost of this would have to be voted on by the board, but I would think we'd want the biggest board we could find. Yep. Absolutely, yes, sir. All right, if there's no other questions, thank you very much, ma'am, and again, thank you for this work, and we'll get there. You're very welcome. If y'all think of anything in the interim, please let, please let Bonnie know so that she can pass it along to me and I'll add it into to my research, please. Okay, the next uh, is the item, agenda item one, which is real estate services, and the manager has that. Uh, yes, you had a presentation from Marguerite Green, who's here with us today, um, on Century 21 being the um, realtoring firm that would work with the city on um, helping us either sell our city land or to buy things that are needed. So um, you asked us to put together some type of a contract, which she's given to me, and she's here today in case you have any questions, or we just are wondering what next steps you would like to take. Okay. With that said, uh, is there any questions? I'm, I'm going to, for me, I'm going to kind of default to you, the four of you that have a lot more expertise in this than I do about the pros and cons of this. I have no expertise other than over the years I've bought and sold a number of uh, uh, properties, but I was the originator of this idea that we obtain a um, commercial broker uh, to help us because at this point we are tasking the city manager to do things that are actually in the scope of professional services that she's not necessarily trained uh, to do. 
uh, negotiating, um, dealing with buyers and sellers. I mean, this is, this is professional activity that people are trained and licensed to do. And for our needs, we've been looking at buying things, we've been looking at selling things, and this is a lot of work to ask a city manager to have to do on our behalf. Plus, you know, there is a perception publicly that uh, uh, realtors have some kind of inherent conflict of interest in anything involving real estate in the city or development. Um, I hope that people will read what conflict of interest is in this state. Um, it's, it surprised me when we were trained that uh, it has to be a direct personal financial benefit to you or your spouse, not your sister, not your brother, not your children, not your in-laws, not your business partner, but you or your spouse. And if that doesn't exist, then the state says you have an affirmative duty to vote, meaning you can't weasel out of a vote that's going to embarrass you or make one of your friends unhappy. You've got to vote. And if for some reason you don't vote, that word, the affirmative duty, means that your non-vote counts as a yes. But the, per the public perception of conflict of interest and realtors on the board is a problem that one of the ways that I thought perhaps we could deal with that would be eliminating any hint that anybody on the board, any realtor on the board, had had anything to do with our ongoing search for properties, uh, selling properties, all of our real estate dealing. So, and since we are, we fall within the, the range of commercial, it seemed to me that a commercial broker who had no specific dealings in the city would be preferably a brokerage that did not uh, have a, an office in the city uh, would be ideal. But we only got one response. And I really appreciate the presentation that we received. Very professional. Um, but I think that we need to cast a wider net. Um, I've asked a number of realtors that I know, and nobody knew about this. Um, I think that there are other places that we can look. Um, Wilmington, for example, and perhaps we should be asking other cities that do the same thing that we're doing, buying, selling property. Who do you use and how do you go about it? Uh, so I'm not, at this point, willing to uh, go forward with a, um, a contract. And I'm, you know, this goes along with my feeling that we are getting ahead of ourselves on some of our real estate dealings. That's my opinion. Any other comment? Is there a motion to be made on this topic? I'm willing to make the motion that we um, look further for and uh, have further discussion on uh, real estate services before making a commitment. Second. There's a motion on the floor and there's a second. Um, is there any discussion? Yes. I just wanted to follow up um, on uh, Lowe's comment about just having one presentation. Um, I think that the letters were probably not received or the requests um, were not re received in a timely manner. And so there might have been more responses um, had we had given a little more time. So I'm willing to entertain that um, process. Any other comment? All right, all in favor of that motion, uh, please say aye and raise your hand. Any opposed? No. I'm sorry, do you? No, I just have a quick question after. Okay. I'm sorry. 
Mark, did you oppose it? Yes. Okay. So it, it goes uh, five to one. Can we have this? Can we? Can we What's name? Mark, do you have any? I see this is mostly we know what we want to buy. We know what we want to buy. They're private properties that are not on the market. We know exactly what we, we want. We know where they're at. We've identified them. We're just adding to the, we're adding a commission onto the top of it. And I hate to say that because I sell real estate and I add real estate commission on top of it. But in this case, we're leaving ourselves to have to pay the, the bill. Normally the seller is paying the commission on the thing. So it's bird dogging property that we already know what we want. And all we've got to do is make offers. And uh, I'm not going to let any of y'all make any money. And I won't either. So I think we'll be all right. So I'm, I'm going to retract the vote just for a second to continue the conversation, if that's okay. I'm sorry. Well, but, but can we can continue the conversation? Yeah, because I, I, it's five to one. Yeah. Okay. And I, I understand, um, I understand where Mark's coming from. So I don't, I don't disagree with his thought process because we're very specific in what we're trying to accomplish with, with either buying or selling property. Um, and I don't think anybody on this board wants to make money off the city. That's not why we're here. So, um, so, so we don't really have anything that we want. Nobody wants us to sell city property. Every time we sell anything city property, I don't think we need to sell anything anytime soon. <laughs> It's, we're running out of space. Why would we sell anything? So that's the listing side of this situation of putting it in the market to sell it, to represent all the people coming at us. Again, I just see that we know what we were looking at is just making an offer on it. And it doesn't have to have a real estate agent to make it, I don't think. On the other hand, there seems to be a good reason that realtors have to go through an awful lot of training and there are a lot of legal pitfalls you can get into with all if this if this am i right oh well 100 percent. and so i completely agree and see the value in what uh, a real estate agent and a realtor can bring to the table so uh, i'm certainly in favor of that um you know because i understand the negotiation process i understand the uh, the psychology of selling and, and, you know, how you go about, you know, that being said, we have four real estate agents on this board right now. That won't always be the case. So if the city of Southport's going to buy or sell something, the next four years might be the time to do it. Um, you know, while we have this type of expertise. Um, so we're in a unique situation, but I also, you know, see the value that Lowe suggested this, you know, I got a lot of negative feedback because I was representing a seller that I thought the city should own the piece of property. I wasn't going to take any money for it. I had no intention of doing that. But Lowe's recommendation that we hire a third party keeps that from happening, keeps the four real estate agents on this board from being, you know, having a finger pointed at them. So I, I, I see the value in that too. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is not a no from me specifically for hiring somebody. It's that, you know, I probably pick up three or four apples before I pick one at the grocery store. <laughs> and right now, I'm the one that fi fingered them all. I touched them all. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, <laughs> but you know, for that reason, I, I just think, and, and, and not to discount Miss Green and, and, and I, great presentation, I would never have done what you did. I would have never sat in front of a board of four agents and presented the way you did. It was so impressive and so good. And so for that reason, I, I you know, uh, I'm not saying no to you. I'm saying I'd like to see more. And I think that the letters didn't get out in a timely manner to everybody involved. So 
that's that's why I voted yes. I think with um, our situation, like what Mark was saying, when we know what we're looking for, we know what we're prepared to spend. It's a f the matter of making an offer, um, and then following through with that. I don't think there needs to be an additional commission on top of that. Um, I think that on the seller side, where we need a listing agent, that's a totally different ballgame. But I think that um, you know part of that is also yes. We, I, I love uh, the, the Apple thing. I'll, I'll agree with you on that. But I'm not going to put it quite the same way you did. <laughs> You know, we can always go out asking for more people to put some input in there. There's always a chance we don't get anything else. So, you know, that's just, that's just, you know, we're rolling the dice there. But again, there may be. And I think it would be good for us to have a relationship that if we need someone, if it's a property that's on the open market, then it behooves us to have a realtor and have representation because there's so much liability in negotiating and dealing in the real estate world that uh, our city manager is not that person that has had the training and knows all of that. So I, I, th I, think, I think having a relationship would benefit us. And she's got other things to do. All right, for the benefit of the clerk, the motion was, as I understand it, it we're going to go back out and re-advertise. Is that correct? Why don't we have the motion read back to us? I have Alderman Davis motion to look further and have more discussion on the issue and second by Alderman Carroll. That, that is discussion amongst ourselves and there's no action for the staff to do is, is from the motion that was presented. Correct. Well, I, I, I think I had said something about looking to uh, further looking for um, what other municipalities have done. Getting for, gathering more information and that would be uh, for staff to do. I mean all around us, uh, Oak Island is a perfect example. They have bought and sold things. And of course, Wilmington. Well, we might, I mean, <laughs> you know, nothing gets done in city government in a timely manner. And so, uh, and I, I threw in the timely manner. What I should have, I should have stopped with a period. Nothing gets done. But what I would suggest is that we, well, let's get stuff done. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, Maybe we go so far as to instruct the city manager to uh, put out another RFQ for, you know, because that was the, you, you said, I think part of what you said, Alderman Davis, was, uh, you know, cast a larger net. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I heard, but I wasn't sure after this conversation that was the what end. our intent was. So are we... That was and the I intent hope of I'm going to yes. do this correctly, and if I don't, I apologize. Is the motion that you you are that you uh, Alderman Davis that you put forth was to go out and do two things: one, look what other people are doing, other jurisdictions, and two, put out a, a different, a, an additional RFP to look at this question. Is that what you're asking for? Um, yes, but I don't know that RFP is the, the way to go. Um, I be, a, a question for the city manager. You sent an RFP to the Brunswick County um, uh, Association of Realtors? Yes, as well as we did um, in Wilmington, too. Okay, and then we did the regular process for RFQ. Um, we might find out then what other cities do. I can do that. I, I would almost guarantee you it's the city manager or an assistant city manager who does it. But I'll research that. Research and come back to us before we go further. Uh, I'm, I'm going to. 
I'm not for this. I'm not for pursuing this. Uh, but Robert, you're probably right. There are not many real estate agents that are going to get up there and do that presentation. No matter how uh, much ego I have, I don't know that I would have tried that. So there might not be a great selection. I personally voted because I don't want to pursue this. And that's all I'll say from here on out. All right, for clarifications, because this is, we have a number of things thrown on the table. Are we asking the manager, as the clerk stated, that we're gonna have internal conversations, including this, the manager, to figure out what the next steps are? If that is the case, if that's what you all thought you voted on, then we have that, we can go forward with that. Is that, and then we come back at another time and from that information decide what the next step after that is. Is that, are we in agreement that that's what you voted on? With I'm, the addition that the city manager will gather more information for us about how to cast a wider net. That can be part of the conversation, but there's no proactive issue here that we've asked the city manager to cast the net at this time. So it is in keeping with what you took down. We've had the vote, it's five to one, unless there's some other discussion. Ready to move on to the next topic? Well, the only thing I would say is that it, my yes vote did intend for the city manager to go out for RFP additional RFP, but I'm comfortable with my yes vote being cast based on what you just clarified. City Clerk, are you good on this? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, Ellie, you're up next, sir, for the authorization to purchase materials for the electrical underground project. Good morning, Mayor, Board. Uh, the, the next uh, item or step in our undergrounding program is the East, is the undergrounding of the Eastmore, and this section is from uh, Fodale Avenue all the way to Howe Street. And we're requesting uh, to go ahead and be able to write a purchase order for the materials so that they can, so that the materials can go ahead and get ordered, um, so that we'll have everything ready when they get to go to work on this project in the next budget year. If we have all those materials ready, um, we won't have to worry about availability delays uh, and pricing will will stay stable because we'll have already paid for it, and um, the materials as I have them for this project to come in at $860,000. Is there any questions of Ellie on this topic? Uh, Ellie, answer any questions. Uh, when we took this off the uh, agenda before, it was because y'all were considering other situations along that, is that? Yes, we were going to come March 14th and moved this to the side because we were going to look at another project that may have affected uh, the Eastmore Underground project. That, we're no longer looking at that project at this time. So this this does not take in consideration those those potential changes. That is correct. Are we ever going to have to take those into consideration? In another location, we really don't know where the uh, next point of delivery is going to be. Um, and we're looking at uh, two years of finding out where it's going to be, building it, and that kind of thing. Curiosity, is this Fodale Inn or, or uh, out? On East Fodale Florida? Inn, from Fodale to Howe. Okay, because that's where they basically ended, right there. Yes, this will help. This will ultimately help the loop. All of Fodale is undergrounded. All of Eastmore will be ungrounded. Uh, eventually, all of Howell will be undergrounded. This will make a nice stable loop and it will help support uh, and, and be beneficial and gain beneficial from the west side that we're currently undergrounding. 
What, when do they start this? Uh, the labor portion of this is slated for next budget year, so after July, and, and that's why they're looking for to get the, uh, go ahead and get the materials on this budget so they can have them and they can be ordered. So by the time we're getting things in, we're ready to work with them. And we won't have, we won't have to delay that project because we don't have the materials. So is that based, I mean, typically, the, I think the last couple of years, we put 1.5 million toward underground in our budget cycle. Uh, so is this 860,000 part of an anticipated 1.5? that we're going to spend in this the, the, year? the total is this thing still on okay the um, we've actually been putting in 1.6 million in each budget we're trying to and this total project is actually coming in a little over at 1.84 million and some change I just have um, one <clears throat> quick observation, and we will certainly go into it in more detail when we get to Ellie's budget for next year, but the, you got, you're gonna have to pay attention to the fund balance, because it is quickly going down. And so I know you guys really wanna finish this off, but just we need to take that into consideration that the electrical fund balance is, um, it, we are spending a lot of big money. So do we, it's slowly gonna go down. Do we know where we are right now? Um, I'll, I'll email you later because I want to make sure because we're meeting this afternoon on the budget and so I'll have a better feel. I imagine though that all of this equipment and material will never be cheaper than it is today. That I am also assuming is correct. This project on, on, on uh, Moore Street, I see in the capital, the SIP program, there's a a, a discussion about having, I'm gonna use the wrong term, smaller loops, in other words, if one part of the town goes out, less, less of the town goes out. This, is not, this will be able to be integrated into that whole concept? Correct. Okay. okay. All right, any other discussion? So the, this came off of the agenda last month. Yes. What changed so much that it can come back now and we feel confident that whatever it was that was the reason why we couldn't do it is not going to come back again? The project that was going to affect this project is no longer. We're looking at different things on that project. We're ba basically going back to the drawing board. BEMC is working and they figure it's going to take them at least six months to put together um, a plan of exactly what we're going to need in order to get that second substation going. That is correct. Anything else? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve, vote to approve the money transfer of the fund balance electrical account, line item 30, 93, 72, 10, 5900. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second. Any conversation? I'm, I'm just struggling. We're making a budget decision for next year's budget, right, today. Yeah, we've done that the last, I think, two years now, where this is not new. This, and actually, I wanted to compliment that the city staff are following up on this idea that, remember, we got stuck with a supply chain stuff and everything dragged on forever and the solution was we have the we have the money right now we have to keep in mind what the manager just said but buy it now so we can move forward rather than have yet another delay the mr mayor the only income enterprise fund we will have is our electrical grid this is the best investment we can be making for southport any other comment? With that, uh, those, all in favor say aye and please raise your hand. Any against? It goes unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you very much. Okay, item H3, which is recycling yard debris. Mr. Flint.
Good morning. Um, so as we are working through the um, issues with the, the water sewer merger, there's a couple of issues that affect customers uh, that we want to talk to you about today. One of them requires action today. Uh, the other one is more just information for you as you uh, move into the budget season and um, consider, um, you know, something going forward. Um, today, in today's world, let me see if I can get through here. Oh, yeah, turn it on. So, as, as we all know, today's world, the, um, the city provides residential pickup of uh, recycling and yard debris uh, for its customers that are within city limits that is billed on the water sewer bill. Uh, it's not an option. Uh, everyone uh, that qualifies uh, because you live in city limits and you're a customer, you pay it. Uh, you don't get to opt out. Uh, you get uh, recycling picked up, I think it's every other week, and yard debris picked up weekly. Uh, and, it's, and we're billing you $12.25 today on your water sewer bill. Um, as we will no longer be doing the water sewer bills, we no longer have the ability to bill for that. Uh, so the question becomes, what do we do um, with those services? And so we have, we have some options. And I will tell you that since this deck was put together, there's new information that's not in here. Uh, so I'll, I'll just talk you through it. And it makes it a little harder and a little easier <laughs> on you, on you um, as we go. Um, so currently, uh, if you're a Brunswick County uh, water sewer customer, uh, you get trash pickup, uh, but you're on your own for recycling and you're on your own for yard debris. Uh, they don't offer it. Uh, and so uh, our citizens, who are, of course, accustomed to this, um, we, we could choose. Let me back up. We could choose to um, say, you know, you're now Brunswick County uh, customers and um, you're on your own um, for recycling and you're on your own for yard debris. Um, we could also choose to um, find a different way to bill uh, the customers and continue to provide both services. Or we could, in fact, uh, choose to continue one and not the other uh, if, if, we so cho if, if you so choose, which would save the, the customers a little bit of money, but then put some, some responsibility back on them as to what they do with their recycling and or yard debris. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so th th this tells you currently what customers are paying for. Um, the $12.25, I've sort of prorated it out according to what we pay. We have two contracts. Uh, GFL is our, is our contractor that picks up the recycling and construction debris, I think it is, uh, picks, up the, picks up the yard debris. Uh, construction waste removal picks up the yard debris. One of the pieces of information that's new uh, since this deck was put together, and this is important, uh, we pulled a, a digitized copy of our contracts, so they've all been sent off to be digitized to look at them because, you know, not too many of us uh, have seen these contracts. And we've realized that the GFL contract, which was originally uh, contracted in 2018, is a three-year contract that automatically renews if you don't give notice within 90 days. So it renewed in 2021, and it's going to renew on June 30th of this year for another three years unless we give notice today which is 90 days out, <laughs> uh, that we do not want the recycling contract. Um, so that's why, uh, that's one of the pieces of new information that's kind of important, and we, we're going to need board uh, decision. If we don't get a board decision today, the contract is going to renew uh, sort of automatically according to contract terms. Yes, sir. So my question is, the county does not do recycle. That's correct. So when our stuff gets picked up in my front yard for recycle, who recycles it? I don't know. Where does it go? Because if it's going over to, to Bolivia, it just gets dumped in the hole with all the other stuff, and we're paying for a recycle, which is what I've been told happens. I don't know that to be accurate, but that there is no recycling around here because the county doesn't do it, and it all goes to Bolivia. So are we paying for something that actually doesn't even occur? Because I've never heard anybody tell me that our stuff goes to a special, special place where it's recycled. Uh, where GFL takes it, I honestly have no idea. 
Uh, what, what I do know is that there's a recycling center right over here across from Smithfield Park that is for free. It's where I take my recycling, um, mostly because I don't want another giant trash can taking up space in my garage, so we, we take it over there. So, um, but where it goes from there, I, I don't know, sir. Can, 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 well, when she comes back, I'll ask her that question about can we find out is there actually recycling? I'd like to have that, at least that clarified that our stuff goes someplace as opposed to we've always done it this way and so that's what how we do it okay um, we talked about during our discussion about the water sewer merger about asking BEMC to add this as a line item to their billing rather than us having to do it is that have we talked to them about that so that's the other piece of information it is not BEMC but actually Brunswick County just within the last couple of days has agreed that they would add it to the water sewer bill and collect on our behalf um, and for a charge of what works out to about 10 cents a bill uh, they it, it, what happened there was this, the, the county manager had said to Bonnie that um, after a meeting, oh, we'll bill it for you. When I took it to the finance director, he goes, yeah, not so fast. I'm not sure I can do that. Um, and so they, they had to actually run some tests in their systems and, and, and you know, kind of follow it through there. And he let me know a few days ago, yeah, we can do it. And we'll ch what we're going to charge you is three quarters of a percent, which is what we charge you for pick for collecting the real estate taxes uh, on your behalf. So that works out to about about a dime uh, a bill, which would, of course we'd have to add back to the to the customer's charges. Uh, but it can be done, and it can be done uh, through through the county's water bill, and it would be pretty much seamless for the for the city customer. Um, you know these the, the prices you see here would would have to go up by the by the dime uh and uh, i'm anticipating that there, i think that there's an escalation clause uh, this based on a cpi that uh that the the regular charges are going to go up so there will be some adjustments to these charges uh, to what the what the customers charge today but we do have an option that we didn't have when this presentation was put together uh to do that it's not bemc it's the county will, will do it through the water bill Ask a question here. Can we state that. What is this option that's not on our agenda here? There, there, there's not real. Uh, for how, how we collect the money, we, when, when we put this together and sent it to you, we didn't have a solution for how, the, how we could bill the customers because the county had not at that point committed that they would do so. The county has since committed that they will actually continue, if we choose to have them do so, bill our water sewer customers for recycling and trash pickup just like we do today and then they'll just remit the money to us on a monthly basis and we would continue to maintain the contracts to, to pick up the the, uh, the recycling and the yard debris have we asked BEMC also because maybe they'll only charge us a nickel instead of a dime uh, okay no okay. we we've asked BEMC other things and they're way more expensive than uh, no. well, I just thank you for the clarification <laughs> so, Question. Bonnie, so, what do you recommend? Never, ever play with people's trash. Yes. This place, they will hang you at Franklin Square. We have to reopen it first. <laughs> <laughs> and, question. Uh, this is actually less than what you've got up there. You've said you say 30 party billing is 25 cents. Well, so this was, is a bargain. What the 25 cents was when I first talked to this, the when I first talked to the county finance director. He says if we can even do it, we'll charge you something. And he says you know maybe maybe 10 cents, maybe 25 cents. I don't know. And so I put in the the highest amount. Alderman Lee. Yeah, you know, we uh, I'm all in favor of recycling. The question is, do we actually recycle? Yeah. Are they taking it somewhere and just dump it in the same landfill? Uh, with everything else, if that's the case, is it worth charging our citizens uh, X number of dollars a month to, for something that is really not happening? Regardless of whether or not it's really happening on the back end, we're doing it on the front end for right. our citizens. Exactly. That's correct. So I guess the, from my thought is, I think that would take like one or two phone calls to figure out whether or not there actually is a recycling. And if there is recycling, then I'm... I'm going to be entertaining a motion to do something here in the next couple of minutes, but I think it really is contingent on whether or not we're we're just throwing it all in the same hole. 
So uh, there's one other there's one other piece to this that's that's important to, for me to point out, and maybe you picked it up in your in your presentation, maybe you didn't, but that is that the what the customers paying the twelve twenty five in today's numbers actually also picks up the public spaces debris, right? When public works picks up the limbs and when they when they pick up road debris and, and that, that kind of thing and it goes to the public's works dumpsters and um, GFL comes along and empties those. The 4th of July, the 4th of July cost the city over $12,000 last year on trash removal. All of that public space um, trash is being paid for here so if we do away with this um, you're, you're gonna have to add about 50 grand back to the city's budget um, from some other source I'd like to make a motion that we uh, move forward with the county billing the recycling and yard debris pickup is a motion on the floor there's a second is there any discussion what are we doing with um, regular household trash garbage okay, so that's the county, the county will do that plus the county will do recycling and debris not exactly the, the county provides the tr regular trash as part of the county's real estate tax bill um, but what they will do is they will collect on behalf of the city through water and sewer bills and just send us the money monthly so that we can continue to provide the recycling and the yard debris service that we currently provide today. What a good deal. So we pay county tax, but we don't get the county yard debris county service. Doesn't, county, county doesn't have yard debris service. Yard debris, uh, uh, trash. We do get the county, we do get the trash, but we don't get any and the county doesn't offer the recycling of the yard debris. All right, so we're at the point of uh, voting on this. All those in favor say aye and raise your hand, please. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One more, one more item. Uh, this next thing I want to talk about just briefly, which is a, another merger issue. Uh, does not require action today. And this is just educational, I guess, a little bit as you go into the budget cycle. This is the Neighbors for Neighbors program, um, which I, probably some of you uh, helped create. Um, so please correct me if I've got something wrong here. Um, in, in, to, in today's world, uh, with us doing the billing for, for utilities, um, we, have, we have this Neighbors for Neighbors program, which uh, is a administered completely through uh, Brunswick Family Assistance uh, in which uh, low-income uh, Southport residents can apply for assistance with their uh, water sewer bill. Uh, the history on this, as I understand it, is in January of 2020, this program was created in response to a rapid increase in the base sewer uh, bills um, that left some people struggling. Um, as you can see here, uh, prior to May 20. 17, the, your base water sewer, uh, your base sewer bill for a typical in-city re city resident uh, was $28.50. By the time we got to July of 2019, it had gone up to 70, over $70. And so in July of 2020, this program was created. And, and here, how, so how it works is Brunswick, someone goes to Brunswick Family Assistance and they apply for, for help. Um, this, the Brunswick Family Assistance then determines if they meet the qualifications and they send us uh, a list of people on the, t on the f uh, by the 10th of every month who's going to get a $40 credit on their bill. If they are a senior, and there's about 28 of them, I believe, you know, it averages about 28 uh, monthly. If it's a senior, the city has been paying for that out of appropriated water sewer funds. Lance, can you remind me what our new base rate is? It's on here. It's $39. So, so um, yeah, so that's where I was. I was we're I was, almost back to where we were. Actually, below, far below where you were when this program was started. And we're losing our water sewer fund on top of that. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, if you're to continue, if you're not a senior uh, in, in your low income and you qualify, Brunswick uh, Family Assistance will send the city a check. And then usually it's about 10 people a month that we get a check for and we apply the check. But if for the 28 seniors that are part of this, the city has been using appropriated water sewer funds um, to, to, to make that payment. 
So um, as you go in, and, and as, uh, as Alderman Kelly pointed out, uh, today, and the, the, uh, the customers have been enjoying their low rates now for two billing cycles, uh, and uh, we've received a few uh, positive comments in City Hall about that. Um, today, the base rate is, is, is $39, which is, you know, it's, it's, over, it's over $30 less than the bill was when we started, when the program was started. So I'm not, I'm not saying there's no need, or I'm not advising one way or the other, I'm just saying that when you get to the budget cycle, one of the decisions you'll have to make is, should we put general fund dollars in to make contributions to Brunswick Family Assistance, which is what we'd have to do since we will no longer have the ability to credit a bill ourselves, we'd have to make a contribution to Brunswick Family Assistance to support this program. Um, that's a decision you have to make. Uh, and, and I will tell you, this thing, was, this thing was double budgeted last year, or in the year we're in right now. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the board donations uh, account, there was, an, I think, $18,000 was included for this. But it was also included in the water sewer fund, which is where it has historically been paid. I've never seen a dollar paid out of the, from the years I looked at, out of the, the board's donations fund. It always came out of water sewer. So it was, it was double budgeted, um, and you'll have to decide whether you put it back into the budget or not going forward. So. Lance, did these 28 seniors get a dollar credit for their last two bills? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did, the, did these 28 seniors get a dollar credit on their last two bills? Uh, yes, they have gotten a $40 credit on their last two bills. But what I'm saying is if the base rate's 39 and that's all they've used was 39, um, are they getting a dollar credit on their bill towards well, anything else? The, so, um, the, so the bill was more than just the base rate. The bill has the consumption on it too. So the bills are going to be much higher than just thirty-nine dollars. That's that's the base rate, uh, and it's, they have the water portion. I asked that that very question, and we, the Brunswick Family Assistance, the program is continuing, has not yet stopped uh, sending us. Um, the, the, the list of folks to, to get the credit. So yes, the, uh, the $40 credit has been applied the last two months to, to about 28 seniors that the city pays for. And then we've continued to get a check from Brunswick uh, Family Assistance for the 10 or so non-seniors that they actually send money in for. Is it possible to make a chart in the future, a chart like that chart for the water fees? Um, sure, I think so. Because our water fees have gone up dramatically as well. And mm -hmm. we're only talking, this was started for the sewer, I understand mm -hmm. that. But I'd like to be able to see how that, Yeah. in and other we'll words, put if, the if, base, the base water. I don't know what the vote will be on this whole thing, but let's assume we, we do away with the $40. Should, uh, some other times should we entertain looking at it for the water fees for those same 28 type of people? That's just down the road. Anyways, we have a motion on the floor. We have a, we have a motion, right? I don't think we no, need. No, I'm a, sorry. We don't need a motion for this one. Okay, this is just for discussion. Yes. Thank sir. you. Um, okay. Uh, the one other thing I just will point out is that Brunswick, part of where Brunswick County, Brunswick Family Assistance gets their funding that they used to pay us for the non-seniors, is uh, we we do get uh, an annual uh, donation uh, every year from. The Wilson Family Charitable Endowment that they give money to the city every year specifically to help pay for water and sewer bills. We take that money and we send it to Brunswick Family Assistance. So that's, that's strictly a pass through. I, I presume that would continue on, but that is one way that the money is getting to Brunswick Family Assistance today. How much is that? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's about 2500 a year. Is that um, Ben and Gibby or is that something really? Cool deal. Okay. Any other questions? Lance, is that it? Yes, sir. That's all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Agenda item H4, which is the discussion and consideration of property for lease. Yes, um, we have the opportunity to lease at 1669 North Howe Street, which is a former uh, bank building, 
just as you enter the Walmart, there's a uh, great clips there right at the moment, but as soon as you go to go into the Walmart, it's right there. And we have an opportunity to lease that, which would allow more space for the police department and also allow City Hall to expand into their, um, their particular part of the building, which would allow us um, definitely to um, have a lot more space. The lease agreement is for $5,520 and 83 cents a month plus utilities. Um, I know at the um, last time we had a quick talk about, you had asked us to take a look at the HVAC system, which is in good order. We've received nothing but positive news about HVAC. And um, also though, as a part of the proposed lease, they have agreed um, to um, anything over $2,500 for that, that, that we would be able to um, pay for that over term. So they've really, moved a lot on that particular subject. So I think if the board would like to, we are ready to uh, have you vote on this lease. It would start today. I would sign it and then they can start making the repairs that are needed and the upgrades to get the police department in there as soon as possible. And Chief Coring is here in case you have any other questions. Uh, okay, I'd like to, for just discussion purposes, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. Motion to authorize the city manager to sign the lease agreement with Admiral Holdings LLC for a five-year lease at 1669 North House Street as outlined on the attached lease to be used for the police department headquarters. There's a motion and there's a second discussion. Um, I think that part of this is, that's important for the public to understand is the importance of a safe and being able to keep um, evidence. Um, and that's part of the reason why a former bank makes a lot of sense. Um, I just, I didn't understand that when the first time we brought that up and I just think that that's an important piece of this. The um, amount of the, the lead, well, the, the rent, $5,520.83 a month plus utilities. That escalates each year, correct? Correct. How much? Um, the following year, year two, uh, 5655.21. So you're looking at $130. Is that each year of the, it goes up that much? each year of the five have years? To, I have it in front of me, um, but I would have to add them all. You know, I mean, let's see, 130. Yes, that's about right. Okay. And then, um, Bonnie, there's the bank portion of that building, and then there's a another vacant space, and then the Great Clips. Is it the bank portion and the other vacant space, or is it just the bank portion? Just the bank portion. Okay. And then they will also have um, designated spots in the back for parking, which is a good thing too. I would also just like to say um, the city has been looking for space like this uh, to relocate the police department for over two years. I, I just want to know that this has been an ongoing process. So. It any other comment? <clears throat> I'll be the Grinch again. Short term problem because we didn't spend money on City Hall. We have places to put them, but they're not suitable because we didn't spend the money to take care of what we had. We need to slow down and, and I'm, I'm gonna move forward with this, but it's short term money for a long term need, so. I, I agree. Bring back City Hall. I, I agree with you, Mark. And one of the um, concerns that I had was looking at the Nash Street Fire, fire Station as a proposed um, location for our police department in the short term. Um, the cost of upfit for that and what they need, obviously, were not going to be suitable for that space as well. So um, those discussions were had. And it seems that this is the best fit to move forward, at least in the short term. And then I think during budget cycle, we all need to get really serious about what our long-term plan is 
and really move, start moving towards that rather than going, okay, we're gonna band-aid this and band-aid this. Um, unfortunately, we are in a position where we have to band-aid at the moment. So um, I just, we've talked about at length how I, you know, I've got young kids here, you've got young kids here, we've, we've got family members here and we wanna make sure we're planning not just for the next five years, but we need to be looking at the next 30 to 50 years and what Southport looks like in that time. So I think that um, while we're gonna band-aid this, our budget cycle is going to be tough because we're looking at further down the road this time. I think I've said before, in fact, I know I have, uh, I think we have too many underused spaces that we own that we should look at first and spend money. If we have to spend money to get them retrofitted, that would be better <laughs> than spending $160,000 a year on a lease for something that we don't intend to keep long term. Um, better uses for our money and better uses of existing facilities. Anything else? Okay, so all those in favor, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I don't disagree with what Alderman Davis said. That's the only comment here. This is not a if, if we could reverse, if we could go back in time and maintain those buildings in a way, we would be having this conversation. But right now, in the short term, that's not a solution that we can, I don't think, I think we can all agree that at this point we can't, we don't have that option. And, and City Hall can't, can't function as it's intended when they're on top of each other the way they are. I don't see five years as short term. I do. I'm just looking around the floor. I have to turn my back on half of you at one time. <laughs> I, 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 there's lots of problems in this world, but the one that we have in front of us right now is a vote. And so all of those, all of those who are in favor of the lease agreement, please say aye and raise your hand. Any oppose? It passes five to one. Thank you. Actually, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with Alderman Davis and, and Alderman Carroll that if we had our things, we could have done this years ago, there would be a different solution, but we're not there. We're here today and we have to move forward. All right. <clears throat> Item uh, H5, which is the public-private uh, donation policy uh, by the city manager. Sorry. Uh, yes, this was brought up a little bit during the um, Rules and Procedures subcommittee that has been meeting. And so I had asked uh, another community for a possible policy because I've never really worked with something like this. And um, members of the Rules and Procedures Committee have kind of done some revisions. And so we're bringing this to you. And what it would be is if the uh, a nonprofit or another organization was raising funds for a city project that's going to be owned by the city, then there would be policies that they would have to follow. We would get a written document together as to the intent of their monies, um, how all the uh, donations would have to be made into the city, through the city, uh, and the money would go directly to the city. Um, and then um, the written document should state the programs and activities that donations would be expended on, and then we would establish a receipt process for donations so that the individual, whoever's donating money, would have a receipt in hand, um, and we would be the one who would be retain um, overall collection of the funds and how those funds are gonna be spent. So this is something, again, the Rules and Procedures Committee had put together, and so we bring you this draft. And I did speak to somebody from the School of Government to help put it, this together. Was another part of this, and correct me if it's if not in this document, had to do with who owns the narrative and how the narrative goes out? Yes. 
So the city owns the narrative and the, the city would have to agree to what's being proffered by the nonprofit, the 501c3, whoever it is, that we all agree that that's the messaging that we want to have to put out. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I, I want to start by saying we had an interesting, right at the beginning of our meeting when Adam Stedman was talking about moving that, uh, what is it, a palmetto, palm? Uh, and I believe I heard him say that he would contribute money toward that if we were balking. Um, does this incorporate that? He yeah. could write a check, right? It does. Okay. And second, if um, t for tax benefit purposes, if somebody wants to donate, um, and they can they donate to the nonprofit, and then the nonprofit write the the check to the city, because they don't get any kind of tax benefit from giving anything to the city I would assume that they could do something like that I have I'd have to look into that I, the, the school of government has something on that and I just can't remember I can't quote it to you I, I think I think it says that you can do that but it specifically addresses that issue in the documents that we got from the school of government on this so whatever the answer is the answer has already been decided. As much as you can say the school of government decides something, you know, we would still have to agree to it, but they have a recommendation. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that what you're referring to is the blog um, article from the school of government donations to local governments. I'm, I'm assuming that's what you were meaning because a lot of some of this language seems to have come out of that. The, I, I just have um, some observations, and um, for the past several years, I know we've been working to create needed policies, and I applaud the effort to do that with this. Um, and it says at the top, donations for city projects. Is, is the focus to provide an accounting process for the city-sponsored events? For example, Shop with a Cop is a, a city-sponsored where we get public monies to go donated to that. Um, rather than being a, pol uh, a policy, is the purpose of this document to direct staff to create a policy? Because to me, um, the langu there's language in here that I've never seen uh, before, like, uh, and it wasn't in anything in the School of Government, even the words used, favoritism, nepotism, or mishandling of funds, that kind of language I've never seen in any kind of uh, any of our policies. Um, and then um, there, it took me a while, the, it's a typo, the, it's 160A-11, not 1601 11 just FYI. Um, so I would uh, certainly support asking our um, finance director to create uh, policy because I think there's multiple things going on in this conversation. We have different types of relationships with organizations within the community. A public-private partnership is usually a, a, a unique contractual agreement uh, that spells out the terms of the relationship like Franklin Square Gallery or the Historical Society and the Old Jail. I mean, I think those kind of relationships is important to have the policy address those as well. Um, is this an effort to create a policy for relationships with partners like Boundless Play? I mean, I, I think that's another conversation where monies are being involved. Um, and we have co-sponsored events that collect money with like the Pole Banner Project. This is a joint project with Up Your Arts and the city provides some of the hardware and they provide or solicit money is what I think I understand about that. Um, the T, we have the group that does the Christmas tea, that then it, the money goes in a line item budget uh, for uh, community relations. So there's a lot. So what I wanted to do was ask Lance, because I figured you'd be here, um, from an accounting standpoint, point, would the purpose of a policy like this really be to establish a special revenue fund as opposed to a, a line item in a budget? So that, um, much like a grant, so you, to your point, which I think 
is the big focus of this is the ability to track receipts and expenditures and depending on the project to be able to span multiple years because if it was a special revenue fund then a project that took several years to come to fruition there would be a way to manage that well i guess my question then is also for lance is if i understood you correctly there would be one thing a special special fund here in my head i was thinking that each project would have its own line item so that we don't we don't get all mixed up as to wh which money went where what how we did all of that because we've had that in the past and i'm trying to figure out it would how be to clarify that it would be a special my understanding is how that works he's here but it would be a, a special revenue fund for each project correct it, and you were asking about the purpose of this. It seems to me that, that accountability is at the heart of this and transparency. And I mean, we, we've had multiple issues, for example, going back to Hurricane Matthew when um, the old city dock was torn up. Well, we had some citizens who looked at that and said, we can get out there and fix that and they probably could have at that point, uh, at that level of damage. And they, a number of people wrote checks and brought it to City Hall and said, if you'll use this money and buy the materials, we will get out there and we will fix the dock. They sure would like to know what happened to their money. I mean, seriously. And then the, the weather tower, there's, questions that I'm asked frequently about where's the money, what's the process, where, who's in charge of this, when's it gonna happen, um, and so on. And people have said, I, I gave money for this. Well, who did you give it to? Mm, I don't remember. Well, there's got to be an accounting problem. That, that part so. we actually can do. Right. The, for the weather tower, if, if you gave money and it, it, if it got to the city, you can you can check to see that your money is there. There's there's a the whole list of all, all I can't remember how many people it was, but everyone's there. But I think I think we have to differentiate between projects like physical projects to benefit the city that become that are on city property that are city property like the weather tower, the old city dock were we to do that. Um, or that to come up again. And um, events, sponsored events, to which people can donate, like shop with a cop. Well, the, I guess, and, and Lance can answer this too. The problem that, that at least I see is when there's money going back and forth, there has to be a, a, a way of doing that. I don't care if you're giving money into the church plate. Most churches have a two-tiered, pers two-person counting system, and they can't be spouses. So if we're going to go right down to, in church, you're going to steal the money or misplace the money or put it in the wrong spot or whatever you're going to do with it, by, well, even if it's not skullduggery, then we have to figure out how we have a clear... I don't, if you're giving money to shop with a cop, there has to be a process that the, the budget guy and the manager know that's coming in and out and how that works. Every program where there's cash or checks coming into the city, to me, and I'll leave it to Vance to tell me whether I'm wrong or not, uh, needs to have some kind of accounting system. Yeah, some of this is not necessarily, I mean, yes, the public, public's donating, but there's no partnership. So. Uh, maybe y'all can clear this up. The Weather Tower is a city-sponsored initiative. People are donating toward, to it, but it's not a separate... What's that? Is it? I don't know what it is now, because there was a declaration in, the, in a local newspaper that somebody took it over. Okay, so, so I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions. There is no ill intent in my question. The, the, other, the other one, Shop with a Cop, that's not a, no, a separate nonprofit, correct? 
No, that's the shop with the cop. The money's already taken into City Hall. You have to you have to donate at City so Hall. So it's not a public private partnership. No, it's a, that's a it's public. A, it's, I mean, that's it's public, us. and we get funding from some people who make donations. Yeah. So the two things are not the same, right? I, I think or, it's okay. Yeah, and so, I think we need different. I mean, the policy. I think part of your conversation is. How, are, how is the city being represented out in the public if somebody's doing fundraising? I think that's a, a conversation, and I would think that I, what I would be in favor of is, is rather than trying to adopt this as a policy, I would, I would be in favor of asking staff to look at all of these layers and give us policies that will manage that same conversation, the same that you're well, talking about. So an example of a private-public partnership would be if, if, if Robert Carroll went out and formed a nonprofit to raise money to build the new fire, no, we don't need a new firehouse, <laughs> new police station. <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, new police station. Um, the money that I brought in, what we're trying to do is get the money not coming to Robert Carroll and his nonprofit, because if it never if it never follows through, then Robert Carroll's responsible for giving the money back to the people who donate it. The city could be held responsible, or at least the uh, perception. perception is that the city is. So we're just trying to get the money not from directly to the city, and the city can take responsibility, or the city has to come out and say no. Though, though that guy's doing his own thing without us. And if you lose your money with that guy, that's your problem, not ours. That's that's essentially what we're trying to do, right? Mm, no. Protect. A little more than that. Uh, and and people people give to the the this hypothetical nonprofit with the expectation that this is where the money is going to go and it's going to be used. Then nothing happens. I mean, this is the weather tower is is a perfect example of this. People have given money and they want to know. When, when are we going to see the weather tower again? Where's the money? What's going to happen? That's our fault. The bottom line. Well, the is, money is somewhere. Yeah, the money's in hall. City Hall. Yeah. Is it? Yes. yes. So the that is. The money is in City yeah. Hall. Whether yeah. all the money was in City Hall, because different people collected. Because different people were going around with the best interests of heart and were collecting money. How it all got to City Hall is not because, of, unless I'm wrong. Uh, the individuals didn't all run in and handed their check in. People collected money and then turned it into the city. That's part of the accounting process that I was looking to try to shore up. If nothing else, just to eliminate all of the perception issues that have gone on. Uh, I'm not suggesting that anybody pocketed anything, but if, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this in a in a church in a church plate, I think we can, the city can stand up to that scrutiny. Well, one of the, I mean, one of the other interesting relationships we have is with the 4th of July Festival Committee. I don't know how that plays out, because that's a, that's a... Different planet. It, but, 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 but similar, because it's not the city of Southport, it's a, we actually are the sponsor. So we're making a donation to that nonprofit so I, I, I'm just trying to think through. I'm, I'm totally for this, obviously. I think we need to find the solution. But I also know that each scenario is different because the, the relationship we have with the 4th of July or the relationship we have with um, Up Your Arts and the Banner programs, each one's unique and different. We just need some guidelines, I think, to keep things on, on track. And that's what we were attempting to do. Lance, got any thoughts? So you're, I think what you're describing is fundamental fund accounting. Um, you, know, you, you don't really, we have more than three funds, if you will. I mean, we, we think about it as the general fund, the water fund, and the electric fund. But um, the, the danger, and I think this is the water tower situation, is that revenue comes in, donations come in, it's put into a miscellaneous donations revenue line in the general fund, years pass by and it's just blended in. It's, it's, some, it's somewhere out there. Now you're relying on spreadsheets 
that somebody has to keep up with and, and you know, people come and people go, like what happened six years ago? You know, well, maybe so is there a spreadsheet of everybody that donated to this? So what we've done here recently, um, so another great example is the, uh, the money we have in the bank for the waterfront stabilization. We have, you know, when I got here, there was $5 million that was in the general fund. Well, it's not really general fund money, it's money that's for the waterfront. So we broke it out and put it in its own fund. Um, so what you're, what you're really describing is a couple of things. Controls, right? Basic controls over cash handling. Somebody comes to the front window at City Hall and they want to make a donation. We have to have a, ca uh, we have to have a, uh, um, in our cash receipt system, a, a specific code set. We set one up for Taylor Field for the inclusive playground. Somebody will come to sit, comes in, they say, we want to make a donation. We know, we put it in this particular cash receipt code that takes that money and puts it into a fund that we set up for Taylor Field inclusive uh, playground. And so it's that, it's that kind of thing. We, we, need, multi, we need a proliferation basically of, of fund codes within our accounting system so that each one of these, and, and, the ca and you've got to reconcile your cash balances too. I mean, you, you can't have a revenue line that goes to, the, to um, a specific fund and leave the cash dangling out there in the general fund. And you've got, to, you've got to do your financial transactions to put the cash, and that's just basic reconciliation. So it, it's, it's not really hard. It, just, it's, it is something that the city hasn't really done a lot of in the past, and so it's be a learning curve for staff. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty basic stuff. So I think this we pretty much have with Lance and with the changes that have been made in Sandy Hall. This sounds good. The narrative is another part of the conversation because now we've got people out there that could be talking about a project like the Weather Tower who are saying one thing and the city's narrative is very different. The city could be saying, no, we already have the funds, we're waiting for whatever. So the narrative conversation is certainly a part of this as well so if 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 i've heard, if I've heard everybody cor heard some of you correctly we'll get to the other side in a minute actually is it let me turn my my side this way what comments are on this side of the table any i think really you know the question is is where's my money can if i need to see it can i look at it and when do you intend to use it That certainly is part of it, but the other part of it is capturing the narrative, capturing the fact that if it's a city, if it's a project that's gonna be on city property, city owned project, the city is the lead for the narrative, for the document that would be signed between the two parties and that, that type of thing. So it, it takes it from our past practice of trying to do the right thing but without any document, documentation for it to something that's more structured and more of what the current business practice is. The city should have the lead on that. I mean, we're going to ultimately have the responsibility for having it done, so the city should have the lead. The city should drive the narrative. Uh, Alderman Kelly? It doesn't look good when people can't figure out where their money has gone. Um, certainly, we are not the first city to have to deal with something like this. Is there something that you've dealt with before um, in your... No? Okay. And perhaps... The Personally, not in has, a city no. situation. Is, Southport is so unique that... No, we, I've, I've never... Uh, I never encountered the policy. Um, it's just never come up. Okay, yes, but Miss Miss Bonnie, is Southport unique in the amount of projects that we have that the public is willing to help fund? Um, probably no. I wouldn't say so. Okay. We just have a whole lot of very generous people here. We do. My, my only concern for this, and I, while I do think accountability is really important in this, is that some of the folks who would normally have donated might decide they don't want to anymore because of a, a new layer of accountability 
um, that they perhaps don't want to open up to. But again, that, that the, the flip side of that is why wouldn't they op open up to us on that? Um, and is it, if it's a nonprofit, do they need to then show us their books and show us some of their accounting on that side of it? Um, it's, you know, where does this end and when we begin this? Well, one of the, I think one of the conversations, you, you, great point, because one of the conversations was, you know, you can't donate anonymously, right? But technically you can't do that with the city anyway. So if I wanted to go and see everyone who had donated to the water tower right now, I think legally the city has to provide me that list. Mm -hmm. um, Does the city have that list? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, so, we do. So I think that's an interesting, you know, but I don't know that there's a way around, you know, if people, if people are donating to a project and they want to remain anonymous, then they should, you know, back up a dump truck with cash maybe. I, I don't know any other way. <laughs> We can't take more than fifty dollars in cash. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I'm sorry, Lo. Do you have another thought? The, do, where are we? Do we want to uh, refine and and uh, uh, do some rewording, slight revisions to this, or do we want to take a vote now? Well, I, I go ahead. Uh, uh, what I would ask is that we give this information to staff because there are multiple levels of relationships with different donation sources. And I mean, as in working with nonprofit, we could set a policy that says, this is how we would like to work with nonprofits. I'm sure other communities have the same thing and that these policies already exist. And I would check with Brady to see, I know he does, they're, they do multiple communities. Maybe there are policies that they have. I mean, Lance could work with Brady to see if that would do. But I think this policy probably needs to be driven by the finance. Can we agree that our objective is um, transparency and accountability? So I guess I'm going to ask for a suggestion here. Do we? Do we do a motion to have staff take this back to refine the language for the different layers of interaction and come back to us with a, a document that's perhaps more refined than the one we have here and so that we can move forward with this whole concept which we appear to have a majority of people who are in favor of the concept we're just trying to refine it. It's, I would entertain a motion to that effect. Oh. Um, I, I would uh, make a motion to ask that staff consider a policy um, for, to Lowe's point, transparency and accountability and process, an actual process of how we do things like this, take donations. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I think that my only recommendation is that whatever, so I know we've got these layers of potential partnerships that we just kind of discussed a little. Um, what I wouldn't want to do is put a, you know, put a particular concept out there and then if, we're, if that's brought to us that that's what we're stuck with. You know, because I think that part of it could be done is this is, the, these are the basics. Mm -hmm. The next step would be, you know, whatever we wanted to do with a non, if a nonprofit came to us to raise money for the water tower or to oversee that project, they present us with, uh, you know, an MOU or a contract of some type that we can all negotiate so in this document it, it's spelt out so that's part and of so that is a finance issue sure for advance part of that is a process issue which is for the manager to, to put all those pieces together working with the school of government and the, and the city attorney to make sure we're legal on all of that and then obviously this legislative body can tweak it when it comes back so we have a motion we have a second all in favor of the motion, say aye and raise your hand. 
Any oppose? Thank you, unanimous. We now move on to the manager's report. Uh, yes, two items very quickly. Um, I, I'm sure all of you know what we've been working with the league who had received ARPA <laughs> funding in order to get Black Mountain software, um, in order to get accounting help through the league, and there's no charge to us whatsoever. And you all agreed to a master agreement with the league. I just wanted to let you know there is another component which we're gonna take advantage of, and that is grant writing. So they can use ARPA funds for grant writing, and we're gonna use that um, to write the Part F grant for um, the inclusive playground. So I just wanted to let you know that. So the league has really come through for us big time with this ARPA funding. And then lastly, since we've been talking about the weather tower, I'll give everybody an update on the weather tower. How's that? So uh, we have about 40,000 right now. We do have an engineering bid that's somewhere, if I can remember right, 70 79. something, if I 79. remember. 79. 79,000. Um, we did put a grant into the Cannon Foundation and they are coming here to do a site visit May 14th um, to see if we're gonna be eligible to receive funding from that foundation. So we are still progressing, we're still working on that. So I just wanna make sure, and if you are wondering, did the city receive uh, funding that I gave to them, you can go to the utilities department or call Teresa Jones at finance department and she's got a complete list so we can let you know. That's all I have, Mayor, unless anybody has questions. I do. What, could you say more about the foundation that's coming to? That, that's all I know is Heather and um, Chief Drew have been working on that. Which foundation are you referring to? The can for the weather tower or for the? The cannon? The cannon, it's, 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 it's the sheet people, mm -hmm. cannon sheets. So when they, when they sold out, the family took a gazillion dollars and put it into a foundation. They give out between 11 and $16 million a year in the state in grants. Really? A citizen in the city brought that to the attention of the city. Uh, the grant application was submitted and now they're waiting to see if the application came in. The citizen wants to remain anonymous. I would like to pat that person on the back, but they, they drove this train forward and it was, uh, got us the contact person, got us all of that stuff. So it's all, all good stuff. Thank you for clarifying that. I thought it had something to do with Thor. Nothing, had nothing to do with Thor, nor the camera company. <laughs> all right, the next item is the uh, mayor's comments. So, uh, for those who participate, it was just a wonderful Easter Passover time. Great, great weather, great everything. Uh, the police department was out in force on, on Easter, uh, at like seven maybe, something like that. Seven officers patrolling. Uh, all, that was all good stuff. Um, as, as you know, we're going into the budget cycle. This month alone, I think we have seven official meetings already on the books, and that doesn't count any ad hoc meetings. So we're earn, earning our pay. Um, and I think that's about it for right now. I encourage everybody who's uh, watching, or gonna be watching this later on, that you keep an eye on the social media pages and the website for all of these upcoming meetings and participate in them and public comment on them because this is how the city is, is driven. It's, uh, it's driven by the public comment and your elected officials trying to make wise decisions. Thank you. So next is um, the board comments and I'll start at Frank's side. I so, said, no, with all that we've done today, I think we're all moving in the right direction. We've covered a great deal of topics. We've made some good decisions today. Thank you, sir. Alderman Spencer. <clears throat> I want to spend, send a special thanks out to Ben and Gibby Wilson for contributing to people's water bills. 
there are a lot of people uh, with a lot of substance in Southport, and we would love more contributions and uh, impact like Ben and Gibby Wilson have made on Southport for taking care of the future of Southport. And I appreciate that. It was interesting to hear. And then um, we need to bring back City Hall. Doesn't matter what it's going to cost. It's costing us daily to not have it. So uh, it seems to all come back to let's get our priorities in order. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> go Wolfpack. Well, then Kelly. Um, I've seen some comments about Franklin Square Park being closed and concerns about other festivals. Um, I did want to reiterate that the 4th of July Festival has made other arrangements for the craft fair. There will be a craft fair. It will be along uh, Bay Street here rather than in Franklin Square Park. I want to make sure that people understand that that is still happening. Um, and then the other thing is the April 8th meeting on our board says it's a 2 p.m. meeting, but on my calendar it says 9 a.m. Can we verify that? <laughs> it's at 9 o'clock, I believe. Okay. I will double check. Thank you. Alderman Davis. Thank you. Alderman Carroll. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that the HPC meets uh, this Wednesday at uh, 4 o'clock at Indian Trail. Um, and then also uh, you have until 3 p.m. today, I believe, uh, to apply for the Southport Fire Department Citizens Fire Academy. It starts next uh, Tuesday, April 9th at 6 p.m. And I think it runs every Tuesday if I'm not mistaken. So a great opportunity. Uh, I don't ask anyone to do things I'm not willing to do. So you'll never hear me ask you to jump out of a plane, <laughs> but uh, I am gonna do this. Uh, I've not done it before and I'm pretty excited about it. So if you have an opportunity and you can't apply, you've got the opportunity to do so um, until 3 p.m. today. And you can go online to southportfd.com or the city's website. Thank you. I was just gonna say, could you say more about what you learn at the fire camp. I'm gonna read. <laughs> I'm gonna read the highlights of the program. You get a tour of fire headquarters. You get to be raised in a 101 foot platform aerial, uh, hands on with the jaws of life, breathing apparatus, fire extinguishers, and a once in a lifetime chance to drive a fire engine in the ambulance. They don't, they don't have to climb the tower, they get in a bucket, oh man. That's the scary part, man. <laughs> My knees shook. All of them in Mosteller. All right. So now, uh, without further ado, the board's going to go into closed session to establish or to instruct the public bodies, staff, or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract. No, 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 no. no, that's the wrong one. There's this one that has been taken off the agenda and replaced with personnel matters. Right. And I don't have that language. Oh. Okay, you, you got it? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, closed session, uh, NCGS 143-318. 11 a6 to consider the qualifications competence performance character fitness conditions of appointment or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or an employee or prospective public officer or employee or to hear or investigate a complaint charge or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee general personnel policy issues may not be considered in a closed session a public body may not consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, appointment, or removal of a member of the public body or any body, and may not consider or fill a vacancy among its own membership except in an open meeting. Final action making an appointment or discharge or removal by a public body having final authority for the appointment or discharge or removal shall be taken in an open meeting. All right, so the, there's a motion to enter into the closed session. Uh, is, I mean, is there a second? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Unanimous, thank you. We're in closed session.
I'd like to entertain a motion to come out of closed session. So move. Second. There's a motion, there's a second. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. I'd like to make, a, uh, I would accept the motion to adjourn. Any discussion? All in favor say aye.